Mark, thank you for taking the time to be on this week's episode of the Silicon Valley podcast. Before we begin, there's a couple of people I want to thank. Barry O'Reilly, who made the introduction, and also Sean Steele, who made the introduction. So a lot of people have connected us. So this was bound to happen. Right. We already had a call. I got to know a little bit about your background, but for our audience out there, can you tell them a little bit about your career up until this point? Yeah, first of all, thanks for having me on, Sean. Super excited to finally get this aligned. And like you said, after the second or third person said we needed to talk, it kind of felt like there was no escaping it, right? Um, yeah, look, I you know, I usually say I'm a serial entrepreneur. Um, you know, my parents will tell you I was a precocious little seven-year-old little kid running around saying I was going to be the next Bill Gates, whatever the whatever the hell that meant to seven-year-old Mark. Um, I grew up in Northern California, so not too far outside of this echo chamber of Silicon Valley. So I guess I was, I had an eye on that and was reading the headlines at a young age and just kind of fascinated by, um, I guess at its truest point, just the idea that normal people could take a swing at something gnarly and crazy and had a chance of pulling together the resources of people and, and making it happen. And you, know, you watch Silicon Valley enough, you get to see that happen all day long, right? So um, I did the service thing first. I did six years Army Special Ops. And when I got out, I was just looking for my first chance to build a business. And frankly, it could have been a, a taco shop probably. But um, I got lucky and um, you know, stumbled across a couple of guys in the back of a warehouse in Las Vegas. And they had this idea they could connect buyers and suppliers on this new thing called the Internet. And that was in 96. So I joined them as employee eight and we grew it to 800 employees. And I rose to the number three person in that company. So everything that was marketing and product and strategy was in my side of the house. I wrote the S1 document, did the roadshow, which took the company public um, in 1989. So kind of an entrepreneurial dream from literally going to clean the bathrooms in a warehouse to ringing the bell in Manhattan. Um, we went public on the NASDAQ, got to about a four and a half billion dollar market cap. So pretty heady days for 25 year old Mark. And I, uh, I assure you I built plenty of character a couple years later when .com 1.0 hit the reset button. But um, yeah, I've just been hooked ever since. I think when you're part of something that goes that big, um, you kind of get hooked. I mean, the whole idea of going big was demystified for me at an early age. Um, and, you know, a lot of my peers were in their 40s and 50s like I am now. And But back then, I was still, you know, just starting my career. I'm like, hey, that was an amazing experience. Now let's take all those lessons and try to get a little bit better at it every single step along the way. So I've been doing startups since. I've been a part of 14 startups where I was a founder, C-level executive, and about a third of those have found exits, about a third of those didn't work out, and about a third of those are still out there. So um, unfortunately, that's a pretty good ratio in this line of work, but I learned a lot, probably more from the scars and the mistakes than anything, but um, I'm still at it and trying to do it at a different scale and a different level right now. Okay, so I really want to dive in on what made the ones successful successful? Uh, what made the ones failures failures and the ones that are still out there? But before even that, I'm I'm curious. There's very few people that have taken companies from that early of a stage and been with them all the way through the IPO, especially those early employees at that, that level. A lot of them get replaced A round, B round or or along that journey. How were you able to stay there the entire time? And also kind of what was your experience taking the company public and and well a follow-up question to that, and sorry, there's so many on this one, but I'm also curious, you always hear VCs, you'll hear investors wanting those people that have taken a company public. What are the skills that are so sought after of those people that have gone through that process? A lot there to unpack, sorry. Well, yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, we could do a whole episode on IPOs, but um, you know, first it's worth acknowledging, like I did it at a different time, you know? Um, I always think when there's, uh, economic downturns or corrections of the markets, you know, even going to the financial crisis, 2008, dot com 1.0, there's always corrections that get built in the market. And for my, you know, my era of going public was 99. And after that came Sarbanes-Oxley. Um, after that came a much higher expectation of what it took to go public. Um, it shifted a lot more into the scale stages of venture capital and C's and D's and and growth stage capital uh, raises um, because I went public on $1.7 million in revenue, you know, and now the threshold's like a hundred, you know? So, and I think that's healthy. I think that's what it should be. Right. Um, when people ask me about the whole IPO process and if I'd ever do it again, you know, my answer is there's some really amazing 
things about going public. Um, there's some, some certainly, especially if you're going to be an active acquirer, um, there's certain things that the public markets give you. But I just say it's hyper important that you get the timing right. And so I always say that if you're, <laughs> if you're in and out burger and you know, like with clockwork, that the next, you know, 20 stores you open are going to make a gazillion dollars, right? Like that's a good company to go public. Not You'd have to, but if you wanted access to the capital and, and liquid markets, that's a, a great company to take public. But if you're still figuring out your business model, and this is one thing like I'm not necessarily a Zuckerberg fan, but there's one thing I give those guys a lot of credit for is staying on the sidelines early on and not going IPO when they could have. And they were they kicked off this entire phase we hadn't you know seen before, which was taking billions of dollars of private money before an IPO, right? Before you had to go IPO to even get close to that kind of capital. And um, I think they were really smart. You know, him and Samberg and a couple of the rest of the team said, "Hey, let's let's get this business model right. You know, let's really have some predictable metrics and have that part of our business mature because people don't realize the burden of running a business from a quarter to quarter basis." Because you have to report to the, the street every single you know couple months, and startups don't think that way. Startups think like, okay, as long as we you know hit our numbers this year, or you know you can be a little more patient. But when you're trying to report basically every six weeks, you're preparing your next round of statements. You know it puts a lot of unnatural pressure on a business model if it's not mature and can't support that. Well, well question on that one: reporting every six weeks. How different is it that type of report and then reporting to your board or given some companies are given weekly or monthly updates to to their investors? Yeah, I no, don't 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 get me wrong. Open communication and dialogue, one of our DNA points to the studio is uh being radically transparent. So we're communicating all the time. So it's different to be communicating, it's a different thing to be judged by the market. So when you go out and you do a quarterly earnings release you're on a call with a bunch of analysts. You're going to be grilled with a bunch of questions. Immediately after that, people are going to come out with their articles about whether or not this company is on the right track or not. They're going to come out with their buy recommendations and their targets. You know, that has a significant impact on the stock every single quarter, right? And once you're publicly traded, no matter what you have in your background or experience, the stock price affects people. Like you walk into customer meetings, they'll go, oh, I see you guys are up this week. Like they just, people are watching. Your employees will be up or down on a given day because the stock is up or down. Like it's just, it adds this whole mental complexity to running a business. Um, and so, yeah, going out there to the quarterly, you have to, and let's say you have you missed this quarter. Let's say it was the right thing not to push a customer. Let's say it wasn't the right thing not to push a customer for a contract, but you know you're going to get a bigger one next quarter. You can make that decision as a private business. You get crucified as a public business. And so that's the difference. Hopefully, if you're, you have a healthy board relationship as a private company, you go and tell that to the board that you're making the right decisions for the business, but you're not doing unnatural things just because the street wants to think about you quarter to quarter. Now, when you went public there, that 99, 2000, that's a pretty interesting time. Was there any stories that you could share for that time period? <laughs> too many, my friends, too many. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that it was a time dot com one lotto where the internet, you know, reminds you a little bit of like Web3 and crypto now, like just everybody thought everything was going to be a Web3 company, right? Everybody, people would reach out to me when we were public and say, hey, I got a buddy who's doing an internet company. I'm like, what the hell is an internet company? Like, they're all going to be internet companies, right? Um, but I think it was a, a really interesting time because it was characterized by the first time you had a lot of really young executives getting a lot of capital and even going public. And I guess my story would be when we were going to do our secondary offering, we ended up doing one of the most successful, I think the most successful offering of 2000, um, raised two or $300 million in like 72 hours and that was a lot of money. Um, and, but I remember going around to the banks the first time we went public, getting the big underwriters to take a look at us wasn't easy. Um, you know, we actually, I think Jeffries and company were one of the first companies they took public. They helped us do our mezzanine round. And a lot of people say we put them on the map after that. Jeffries is a monster today, right? Um, we had Robbie Stevens. We had a few banks that were like maybe second tier to help us get the IPO. By the time we did the secondary offering, we were going walking into the biggest banks in you know, Wall Street. And one in particular who I won't mention, but one of the largest in the world, um, you know, we sat down with their managing director and he asked us how long the capital is going to last us. And 
we were really proud that we created this business model that's going to get us profitability in about two years, within two years of that funding. And he went off to just basically castrate us and say we didn't have enough vision for how big our market could be if we weren't willing to lose money for 10 years. And he, he wanted us to go back and recalculate because it sends the wrong message to the street if we think that we're going to be profitable that quick because we're not being aggressive enough. And, you know, within about 12, 18 months, the dot-com 1.0 had happened, you know, bust had happened. And, you know, Amazon was at the 93 cents a share. I probably should have just sold my bike, you know, and bought shares. But, um, you know, that I remember reading a quote from that person in Wall Street Journal saying, yeah, you know, we all got caught up a little bit in the moment. It's really unfortunate we bet on a bunch of young kids that didn't know what they were doing, you know. And you just don't realize how much pressure there is from the big C's and people and what, how implicitly they were part of, you know, some of the decisions that went into, you know, probably destroying companies that should still be around today if you weren't pushed to think so grandiose, you know. I love that story. And I just like how, uh, you know, him, him quoting in the, Wall Street Journal. Oh yeah, it was these guys. <laughs> I still got to get my bonus here. So yeah, these these people here. So so going back. So you took the company public, but you're an early employee. Why then switch from the role of being uh, an early employee at another company to then basically after that every company you've been at, you were either a founder or co-founder, right? Have you been an early employee since then? No, I mean, I guess even the IPO, I was, you know, in some cases referred to as a co-founder, you know, I was still one of the early folks and senior folks. Um, so I really felt like I built that from the ground up with everybody else, you know, so I guess I've always thought of myself as, as a builder. So it wasn't hard for me to naturally think of what's going to, what am I going to build next, you know, especially when, you know, any young entrepreneur, there's so much to learn. There's so many things to figure out. That once you've been through it a few times, it, you just kind of gets easier and easier to think about doing it that way, right? So, I, I had this really remarkable experience that was so big and taught me so many things. You know, such a short period of time that I think it just set me on a direction that was probably going to be unmovable. That I'm supposed to keep doing startups, you know. Okay, now with mm -hmm. that, now let's go into that question of 14 companies. A third has has done well. A third hasn't, and a third still going. Well, one, that third that's still going, wouldn't you consider that, you know, successes right there? Why why just put that in its own category? I mean, any company that survives more than a year, I think most people would say, you know, two thumbs up, great job. Yeah, look, I, um, I think some of those are still out there are going to have potentials for, for exits. But, you know, any venture investor knows that you have a bunch of stuff in your portfolio eventually that may have some viability in terms of you're not going to call it a failure, but is it really going to pay out in terms of some kind of exit for, you know, early shareholders or early people who are involved? And, you know, as companies go on and on and they raise more capital, they get more diluted, they find, you know, their own kind of sweet spot. It might be that you thought a company was a billion dollar company, but they settled into, you know, one and a half million in revenue and that's enough to support three, four founders, but there's really not much more going out to investors. Right. So I think there's always a nuanced answer to each one of those things. Um, but um, yeah, no, I think that the, the lessons you learn along the way and something that we've tried to feed into nobody studios a lot, you know, and I'm, I've got my collection of lessons. And those are the 14 companies that I was actively day to day involved in, but I've also been a mentor and consultant and a small angel to, you know, probably another couple dozen startups. So there's a lot of, a lot of lessons there. And, um, you know, our team is, has just as broad a background. And so we all kind of have spent a lot of time consolidating those lessons. Um, you know, I think that there's, there's interesting things about, you know, if you, a lot of VCs will say that one thing to look for is team, you know, um, I don't think culture is talked about enough because I think when a VC says that they're, they're conditioned to think about looking at VC, you know, CVs and resumes, you know, does a person have a background that would support they could do this again? Do they work at an appropriately impressive company that reachieves some kind of milestones, right? And those are all certainly part of it. But I think when you're a part of, you know, you're a senior engineer at Google or you're a big, you know, part of something like that, it's really hard sometimes to understand what role you really played <laughs> in some of those companies. And so I think that can be misleading. But I also think the number one consistent thing, because when I started Nobody Studios, I actually did a process of looking at every single company and that I was a part of and wrote down the lessons, the things we got right, the things we got wrong, the things I got wrong. Um, 
And one of the most consistent things that was a threat to a company or wasted a lot of time, or I believe put it on a different trajectory was toxicity creeping in, creeping into the culture. You know, and you kind of mentioned it earlier that, hey, people get to series A or B or C and people start switching people out. And sometimes that's the right thing. But it's also one of the riskiest moments of a startup because like culture and the lifeblood of the founders and the vision and the passion that gets something like that off the ground, passing that baton to somebody who has maybe different skill sets to help it scale to another level, but doesn't lose that magic. I think it's one of the riskiest parts of a, of a startup. And, uh, you know, for me, it's if I could look the ones that I was most disappointed in. Um, I would say two of the three biggest appointments were related to culture and toxicity. And one was related to just market market timing. Okay. Now I'm sure our audience is listening, going, wait, he's mentioned nobody studios two, three times. Now, Mark, can you tell us a little about nobody studios before going back into some other questions? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, sorry. I didn't even realize we hadn't talked about nobody. Um, so nobody studios, we created this about three years ago and it was, you know, the culmination of my career and our founders careers of saying, okay, what are we getting right in startups? And can we create a little bit better model? You know, one of the opportunities we saw was down valuations are getting really crazy and funding events at a young, young stage of a company were getting kind of crazy. And we actually believe there's two things that was doing wrong. It's, taking away high quality early stage companies because you want a high quality early stage company is like the way they used to be built where people have maxed out their credit cards, borrow money from grandma. And it forces you to build feature sets and companies that are viable. When you raise $10 million on a $40 million pre and you're still in your garage and you get your dog barking in the background, like that kind of money takes your eye off the ball a little bit unintentionally. You know, you start getting ahead of yourself in terms of building your executive team and your headquarters and the, PMS color of your paint, your lobby, and all these other things that don't really matter, you know? Um, and so the other thing it does is it creates companies that are too hyper-valued. And so the, one of the things we saw on the market was there's a tremendous amount of appetite with publicly traded companies who I believe are increasingly becoming uh, self-aware that they can't innovate fast enough to keep up with technology right now, and that they're going to have to double down on one of their strengths, which is their ability to acquire. But if every new startup out there thinks they're a unicorn, <laughs> you have this massive appetite and people can't find the deal flow they're looking for because the venture world right now is creating people who are overcapitalized. Unicorn or bust has really taken hold in the last two or three years. And I think it's to the detriment of a lot of startups, and a lot of founders and investors. Um, and so, yeah, we found it around this idea of building companies faster, frugally, aggressive, um, keeping the cap tables disciplined, being completely happy with the early to mid stage exit. Doesn't mean we won't have a unicorn, doesn't mean we won't have something that goes the full distance to an IPO, but our model doesn't expect it, doesn't count on it, doesn't depend on it. We really do think if you get this good, healthy, early stage company thing right, you're constantly coming across early to mid stage exits and that makes our model, our model work. Now, do you think that's the biggest problem right now for companies coming out of these brand accelerators like Y Combinator and 500 startups and that, or are there other problems as well that, that you're seeing? I think the unicorn mentality has got a lot of problems inherent in it. And the problem is you have an entire generation of entrepreneurs who have been like brainwashed to think that that's success, you know? And, you know, my data points are I get reached out to every single day and you leading up to doing the studio, people reaching out wanting to talk to me about an angel investment or be joining as an advisor or a mentor or something. And there was just this kind of process two or three years leading up to this where every founder I talked to, that's all they could talk about was valuation. And they would say how they're going to be a, a unicorn. They're going to be a unicorn. They're going to be a unicorn. And it really pushed me over the edge when someone told me they're going to be the first decacorn in their category. And I was like, whoa, pause, time out. Um, and I would hear them tell stories and you could see their energy and their excitement because they'd be like, oh, yeah, my buddy just raised $15 million on a 40 pre. Now they're about to raise 50 on a 200. And I get it. Like, that's what we glorify. You know, that's what the press releases glorify. And that's what's in the TV shows and everything else. You don't understand what they're talking about, right? If you ask most of those guys, okay, would you take 150 million cash for your business right now? They'd be like, yeah, you know, I'm only doing this a year, but they don't realize they can't. If you just raise 10 or 15 million on a 40, everybody on that board is expecting a 10x. That means you have to sell your company for 700 million, and they don't even understand the basic economics of the cap table. They don't understand that when you take on that kind of capital, you're also taking on more of a job than you are your kind of startup world. 
And what I believe is really critical in early stage startups, is that ability to be able to pivot rapidly and, and respond to what the market's telling you and the customers are telling you. And most companies that I've been a part of that did well, you started out thinking you're going to go one direction and maybe it was 30 degrees off by the time you found your sweet spot. It's really, really hard to go back to a board three months after you just raised $15 million and go, you know, the whole thesis I just raised all that money on. Yeah, we were wrong. <laughs> and so it's ironic. The innovator's dilemma is often attributed to established businesses and corporations that have established revenue models. But I see innovators dilemma every single day in the startup world because of the capital they've raised and the expectations of that board. Mark, for our and audience, innovative dilemma. Go a little bit deeper there, please. Well, the innovator's dilemma, you know, it's just a, it's a great book. And, um, you know, kind of I grew up my career on those those kinds of books. But um, it's this whole idea that one of the things that becomes one of your, your biggest um, roadblocks to future innovation is that you created, you're already successful at doing something, right? So you already have a great business and then maybe it's a billion dollar business model. Well, the thing that's going to disrupt you, you might even be able to see it. But do you want to go create something that's going to disrupt this thing that's working so well? And probably at that point in your business, you're really all systems and all focus are making and propping up that business model. You know, it might support your stock price, it supports your finance, it supports everything. And so you get in the problem of your previous successes get in the way of your future success. Um, and so it, it precludes you from making the changes or pivots that you need to do in your business model because it's hard to say like feel that and just like if it's not broke, why you know why fix it, right? But this, you have to think differently in the technology right now because it may not be broke now, but if you know you're about to be disrupted in three years, you better be ahead of it. And a good example is when Uber were just kind of popping onto the scene and raising a bunch of money early on, it was in their theses and you'd hear stuff about them working on self-driving cars. And a lot of people were like, what? Like you guys have, you know, you got, this is, you got it made, you know, you got this billion dollar business, you're raising a bunch of capital. Everybody wants to use you. Why are you going off on this tangent? But it's because they were already saying, what's going to, what's going to disrupt us? What's going to disrupt us? Our biggest challenge in this business is getting drivers. Our biggest cost base is getting drivers. So when somebody comes along the way and has a self-driving car enabled Uber, we're screwed. So they were able to early on think about what was the most likely thing to disrupt them and make a big bet on it. Most people can't do that. Okay, then with that, should these companies, when they're going out to raise capital or just when they're kind of game planning, should they be thinking 15 years in the future? Should they be thinking five years in the future? Should they be thinking one year in the future? And with the different time periods, what would the problems be that they would face? What's the recommendation or from your experience, a good time time frame? I certainly started my career thinking in terms of 10 and 20 years. So that's the, the business models you want to build. And and please, listeners or else, don't get me wrong. We want to build viable, you know, healthy, profitable companies that have the long term ahead of them. I do think when you're getting into product planning and you're getting into, you know, fighting for a market and trying to own a piece of a market and defending a brand within a market. I think we're closer to the five-year end of spectrums than we are in the 15-year. Because I don't think one of our theses in the studio is that a paradigm shift is something that makes you recalculate everything, right? You usually don't even see it coming until you're like, oh, crap, I got to change everything, right? And we've all lived through the internet age. It's a great example of a paradigm shift, you know? And we started this, the paradigm shift in the mid-90s. You know, it, it, since then, it's changed how we date, how we bank how we elect our leaders. I mean, it's changed everything, right? That's a true paradigm shift. If you look at the Fortune 2000 and 1990 to compare it to today, you know, it's, it's completely different. Um, the most ca heavily capitalized companies, I think the top five weren't even on the list or only one of them was, right? So there's a lot of things that have changed in that time frame. That's a paradigm shift, but a paradigm shift like that, we believe there's five to 10 of those coming in the next 20 years. So you have the kind of complexity and change we just lived through for 30, you're now going to start to deal with multiple at the same time. And they're not going to give you 30 years to adapt. They're going to be more like five and 10. And we think of things like, um, you know, crypto and AI and robotics, the breakthroughs in biochemistry that will lead to longevity. You know, there's so many things ha happening that are going to make you fundamentally recalculate businesses and business models, which means we think it's going to be incredibly uncomfortable for a lot of incumbents. It's going to be a very disruptive time for a lot of folks, including 
a lot of unicorns are going to have to recalibrate their businesses. But it also represents an exceptional opportunity for innovation and wealth creation if you get it right. Mark, every time you talk, I, I, have, I think of three or four other questions I want to ask you. It's hard to pick the, the next one. Okay, Nobody Studios, I want to go back to that. It's a venture studio. I think one of the foundation questions is kind of what is a venture studio? And then if you're planning everything for that possible acquisition four or five years later, kind of how is that structure in the company planning like taken into account when there is this, okay, we're going to scrap it by this date, sell it by this date, or spin it off by this date? Um, yeah, so a couple of things in there. So I guess I'll take the first first. Um, so what is a venture studio? So different from like an incubator or an accelerator, although there's some things that look similar if you just glance at it, which is an incubator accelerator is looking to have a pretty robust network of talent and mentorship and experience, right? And they're bringing that to founders and helping them, you know, hopefully accelerate their business. Um, and I love the accelerator model early and there's looking wrong. There's people get it right. But um, I think one of the challenges of it, and I was a mentor and, and tried to get involved in those systems early on. But I think what I realized early on was that at the end of the day, the mentors and the experts that are part of those don't have enough skin in the game to really dive in and help these founders. And so they're almost like glorified boards. And I've had a few fantastic board members, but they're the exceptions to the rule. Most board members look at a business through a straw. You know, they haven't thought about you for 90 days and now they've got one hour to think about you again and make some snap judgments. That's not all that constructive, right? Um, and unfortunately, I think mentor, mentor programs start to look very similar. So unless somebody can have enough meaningful equity involved in what they're doing, they're not opening up their Rolodex. They're not laying in bed at night thinking about a feature problem with the product set. You know, they're just not actively involved in building the business. And I think that that's one of the biggest expectation gaps that people don't talk about a lot. When you talk about the founders getting accepted into some of these programs, they really feel like they just made it, right? That, hey, look at all of this access to resources and expertise and knowledge I have now. And I think what it's turned out to be is a glorified training program and some press. That's what I think it's turned out to be. Um, we are on the other end of the spectrum in terms of we are builders. We roll up our sleeves. We, we are the majority owner of these companies we get involved in. So we have a lot of skin in the game. We spread that out appropriately across our portfolio and our networks. We have the right people who can dive in and help these companies come to life. Um, and yeah, we're technologists, we're strategists, we're marketers. We fundamentally... We're not a passive investor. Like these are our babies. We don't bet on anything. We don't think we can't bring to life and make successful. With that, what does a, a, a cap table look like for these? Because you'll have the entrepreneurs that are creating the companies, your team invest in and hands on. How does that how does that get divided up if you're okay with sharing? How do you incentivize the entrepreneurs to work with you versus having a company on the outside? How does the structure look like? Yeah. So um, first, it's worth pointing out that we're we're active ideators. Uh, so a heavy investment into ideating across different categories and themes that we believe are the future of innovation and some of the biggest opportunities in our lifetime. Um, we're building very robust advisory boards as well. A lot of them from our investor groups. Um, so we are we're confident in our ability to identify things we care about and are willing to make bets on. A lot of the companies we're currently building came off of our whiteboard, right? So in that case, we truly are founders. Cap table on that first day is 100% studio. And then we're looking to recruit a founding team that could get anywhere from 30 to 35% of that company to come in and help us build it. Um, the, the one key difference maker we did in the studio early on, though, is that we, if you're part of any one of our new codes, you're in equity across the whole portfolio. And so we make a really mean argument to an early stage founder who can come in, have a company that's funded, have some income, have an instant founding team that you know makes their chances of success a lot higher, but they're also now part of 100 companies. Our goal is to do 100 companies in five years. You know, we have 14 in development. There's a lot of exposure to upside that you wouldn't get otherwise. In fact, the only people who would get that kind of exposure would be an investor, right? As an employee, you have to make these serial bets. Okay, what am I gonna bet on this next three or four years? And if it doesn't work, better pick better next time, right? If you have two or three failures in a row, it kind of sucks. Um, and we're trying to mitigate that risk for 
for startup you know, executives and employees who can be exposed to a lot more upside. So if Nuco 22 has an exit, but you're working on Nuco 8, you're going to get a piece of that exit. And it also makes this cross incentivization in terms of like a kritsu of talent. And the way that people are interacting across the companies is just inspiring. You know, the way we're able to solve problems, the collective brain trust of the studio, because people really do co-own each other's companies. You'd mentioned the ideas for a company comes off the whiteboard. Tell me a little bit more about that Venn process, because, I mean, who knows? Maybe that whiteboard has a new idea every 15 minutes. Yeah, it probably does. Um, well, I think one of the things that we are getting better at this year, and we're setting out a goal for the next 24 months, that a lot of what we build will be focused on what I call building capacity in the studio. So as much as I might get excited about the Uber for cats, if I can build, <laughs> if I can build a company that helps us scale the studio, I'm going to build that first, right? So an example would be, you know, talent's a big part of what makes our world go around. We've been very fortunate. A lot of great people are always reaching out. Um, but we think that recruiting and engagement with potential, you know, employees and talent is changing. And the old school way of headhunters or putting something on a job board, we don't think any of those really cut the mustard. And so we think those are real opportunities to innovate when you take into effect communities like in Web3 or you take into account the power of social communities and social networks, that that's really the way you want to be connecting and resonating with your future, you know, talent, you know, pool in the future. We think there's a company there to be created, but it happens to be something we need to solve for the studio anyway. So you see how investing on one thing that solves our problem, but then other companies can use it. That becomes what we call a machine of machines or a capacity builder for the studio. And that is one of the first filters that we, we apply right now to our ideas. Just building capacity because it'll allow us to do all the Uber for cats we want, you know, five or six years from now. I like how you just told our audience about probably the, the next deca, deca corn right there. Yeah. Uber for cats. So when you're discussing this with either potential founders of companies or investors, are, do you have to explain a lot of the model to them or do they just kind of get it or are they looking for something like this? Yeah, um, I, well, we, so there's another thing I would say is just to add some context. Um, the other area that we get a lot of ideas, is we will do what we call, for the lack of a better word, a, a mini acquisition of early stage companies. So if something is already going and there's a founder and they kind of, maybe they got a small founding team, they might even have an MVP in the market, they might even have some early revenue. They probably haven't brought in professional capital. So it might be friends and family and personal debt or something. But there's a lot of these walking around out there with some really great teams with some, they're onto something. But, you know, not everybody's equipped or even has a desire to take something they full distance. A lot of people will have the desire to see something come to life. <laughs> A lot of people have this burning desire to be part of something bigger. And I think that's even more so today after the pandemic than ever before. You know, we hear a lot from people saying, after the pandemic, I was determined to do something that got me out of bed again, that I thought I could make the world a better place and impact people. And, you know, that's wrapped pretty tightly into our DNA and our tone and our, our brand message and how we describe ourselves and how we engage with the world. And so I think that's resonating. Um, and again, when you get down to economics, we make a pretty mean argument because if you take your own company the full distance, that's a pretty lonely route. <laughs> You're going to get diluted along the way. Um, your risk of, of failure statistically is very high. Um, and if it doesn't work, you're back to the drawing board. Whereas being part of the studio, you're you know, essentially always part of the studio. You can go to the next company. If other companies are succeeding, you enjoy those that upside and you have the founding team and you have the capital. So. Again, I, I think we made a, a pretty mean argument to folks that are looking at their options and we don't need to be for all people. You know, the ones that have come to us and we made announce an acquisition last year for the first time and use that as a testing ground. But we will be announcing two this quarter and we'll probably do four or five this year. And so the folks that have come to us and just been all in, you know, it's almost like the economics are almost secondary. They know that if we get this right, they'll be fine but they want to be part of something bigger and, and they associate themselves with kind of the larger mission of what nobody is. Okay. Now I definitely want to ask more questions about your career and that before starting nobody studio, but even before, for that, I do have another question. The companies, when, when in their life journey, does kind of the team at nobody studio say, Hey, you know what? This isn't in the milestones that we thought it's time to wrap it up and dissolve this, move on and, and, 
what do those conversations look like? Because if they're kind of part of this family almost, I think I would guess it'd be a lot tougher than just that VC or that someone on the board going, yeah, we're not going to put any, any more money in this next round kind of conversation. So think of it this way. Our job is to really own the incubation. So from, I say, zero to 12 months or zero to 18 months. And there's an important validation step for us, which we think is we're always internally talking about, which is ultimately you're trying to create a company that's fundable by other investors, right? Um, because I, even if you had all the capital in the world, you wouldn't want to fund your own deals because you could end up funding your own bullshit. You know, <laughs> you want somebody else to be a, a critical factor to challenge you and make sure that you're hitting the mark, right? Um, and we see the VC community and you know, really as brethren. We're just focusing on the early stage stuff, but we should tee up a great source of deal flow for you know, our brethren in the venture world. Um, so our job is to get it there. At that point, once it's gotten its external capital and it's moving on, we're not really a part of those decisions. The company's freestanding. It has its own team. It's got its own capital. Um, it has to stand on its own two feet. We might still be a very large shareholder, um, but we don't have the ability at that point to make those decisions. It's incumbent upon us to make those decisions when it's in the incubator, right? It's incumbent upon us to say, hey, this isn't working. And and actually, the model is built that way. And so I think people walking into it understand our model is called progressive, which is a mix of frugal and aggressive. Um, and it basically says, hey, instead of overthinking on the due diligence, is this a business model we believe in? And are we 100% sure this is the right team and this is the right everything? When you're doing early stage companies, you can't think that way, right? You can think that way at a Series A. An early stage company, your job is to say, okay, do we think this, do we have enough reason to believe this is an interesting business model? Now, what would we have to do to prove it in the next two months or three months? And you're crafting experiments and you're, you're just assigning a certain amount of investment to those things. Now, as you're going through that system, you're building more and more conviction in that business model or not, right? If two or three experiments fail in a row, we're like, hey, we really thought we were the thing, but nobody's booking. Um, you, the, the data will tell you, right? Um, so I don't think that you're getting so fully baked or emotionally committed into something until the data and, and the results in the market are proving proving that and invalidating that, and giving you the conviction to feel that way, right? Um, and I also think that more often than not, you're not necessarily saying it's a bad idea, we're done. You sometimes are saying, hey, this is a pivot 50%. You know, we went a certain direction and now we realize more where the market is. This is a new direction. That might be a new experiment for us. Um, or you might be saying timing's off a little bit. We still love this business model, but until this key person is found, we can't move forward. So we pause it. But that's a power for our model. Because in venture, once you light the fuse on a burn rate, man, you just keep burning through that every single month, right? And that's how these numbers get insane. You know, people spend a lot of money and have little to show for it. We are actually counting on the fact that we don't need to and won't do that. We don't sign people up to big salaries and incubation. Um, we give people the option of some freelance dollars or some equity, and most people take a lot of equity. Um, and we're really building it on the lean to mean, um, just to say, hey, if we can prove this, then it's externally fundable. And now you have people switching from a day job into a full-time position, and you've got something that you can run with. But it's how startups used to be built in the old days. You know, you you tinker on the on your side project while you're working the day job. You know? Do you have a company or two that you'd like to mention or tell us kind of what they're working on and, and problems they're solving? Yeah, um, it's like having a family of 22 kids, you know, like, <laughs> who's your favorite? Um, so ThoughtForm is one we're super excited about. This is like the team that we acquired last year. Um, they're in a category of uh, low code, no code, which, um, you know, it's just how do you build complex technology products without having to have a team full of developers, which are harder and harder to find and cost a fortune. Um, there's a lot of breakthroughs in technology that are, are creating more building blocks and more repetitive in this nature, the ability to build stuff faster, but very complex products, right? It's not like a website template builder. You can build full functional technology products. Um, it's one of the most heavily invested category in the last three or five years. You know, low code, no code has gotten a lot of VC attention. What we liked about these guys, is we um, they're doing something really unique in the low code, no code space. Everything they've done is serverless, which a lot of the low code, no code means you can build a product, but then you still have to figure out where to host it and set it up, et cetera. With ThoughtForm, it's all instantly deployed in the cloud um, and you don't have to worry about server management. And that getting that architecture right early was a challenge. Um, but it teed us up, and this is our thesis when we brought them in. It teed us up for what we really think the future of low-code, no-code is, which is intelligent low-code and no-code. So now you apply AI 
to how do you rapidly build things on the fly or how do you optimize them once they're deployed, which in the current world is two different development cycles. You build something and when someone else in the marketing team is watching if it's working or not, and if they want to make changes, now they got to get back into the development cycle. You know, Once you're actually able to build the products yourself in a serverless way, you can apply AI to say, is this working or not? Hey, should I change the color on this page or the button on this page? Should I go from four steps to three? You're constantly self-optimizing, and we think that's going to radically change the you know this multi-billion-dollar market. So we're pretty excited about it. With all these companies in that, how much of the success do you think is luck? You mentioned timing is important, but does luck play a factor in it? Luck for me the, has turned into serendipity. In my, that's the word I use, right? I think that when you are doing things for the right reason and and vibrating at the right level and you're putting it all out there and you're living your truth the universe has a way of serendipitously bringing you the things you need and maybe in a previous life i would have called that luck but i do think that every business i've been a part of where we've had some awesome successes there's always been one phone call or one meeting or one chance you know customer relationship that you almost didn't get because you almost didn't return that call or you almost didn't go to that trade show or you almost didn't reach out to your buddy on LinkedIn. You haven't talked to you for seven years, but you thought, what the hell? But then he connected you with somebody. And that has been true for the studio's you know, journey, like in spades. Like I couldn't tell you so many examples. It's just overwhelming. Um, even to the point where something's really stressing me out, I'll 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 dim the lights, light some incense, man. I'll just like focus and meditate on it. And like two days later, someone's calling me out of the blue and they got the solution. Um, so I think for me, serendipity has become the new luck. All right, Mark, is there any other wisdom you want to pass on to, to our listeners before wrapping this up? Any, any key takeaways from your career journey, companies you've worked with, any, anything that actionable items or stories? Well, I'll give you a softball from a podcast I was on not too long ago, but I thought it was a great way to end. Um, it, it, I thought we were done. It was at the last minute doing, you know, small talk, but, um, he asked me at the end, he said, oh, wait, Mark, by the way, the, the vision of what you're doing is intoxicating. It's super exciting. It's so you know big and ambitious. But how are you to know when you arrive? Like, it feels like this could be going on forever. So how are you to know that moment where you're like, we arrived? And, and the answer we, we've been using a few times since, um, I said some version of this. I said, you know, someday in the not too distant future, there'll be an entrepreneur who I've not met in person from a country that I have not been to physically will identify a problem that I might not resonate with and propose a business in the form of a nobody studios company that I might even be dubious about. And they're going to bring it to life in the form of a compelling company. That'll be the day we arrive. And I believe it's not too far out where I think we're already talking to those entrepreneurs now. And it just excites me to no end. We have a very global view into our studio too, which we didn't touch on earlier, but um, I built a lot of international businesses, have been fairly well traveled in my life. We just believe that some of the biggest opportunities in markets right now are in underserved markets. Africa got 2% of venture capital last year. That's a crime. You know, you look at Asia, the opportunities are just mind blowing. South America, the same thing. Um, but also some of the emerging founders that wouldn't normally be served by the traditional venture world. You know, the status, something like 60 or 70% of venture capital went within 40 minutes of Sand Hill Road. You know, that's a limiting factor to who's getting funded. It's a limiting factor which ideas are coming to life. Um, so we're leaning in on that and I'll, I'll be proud to celebrate that day when, you know, our, our, gro- our global reach and our ability to impact people we've yet to meet will be one of our definitions of success. Mark, fantastic. And if anyone wants to find out anything more about you, Nobody Studios, what's the best way to go about doing it? Yeah, nobodystudios.com. Um, we're also in the middle of an SEC registered crowdfunding right now, so people can get directly involved in us. Um, we're at republic.com slash nobodystudios. I'm an open book. Mark at Nobody Studios. Reach out anytime, me or anybody on the staff. Fantastic. We'll have that information in the show notes. Once again, I want to thank Barry O'Reilly and Sean Steele for making the introductions for this this episode. And when I'm not the host of the Silicon Valley podcast, I am an investment banker focused on mergers, acquisition, growth capital, secondaries. Hopefully I'll get to work with Mark and Nobody Studios in the future. Just plan that seed today. And Absolutely. with that, I want to thank Mark once again, and I want to thank our audience. Check us out on the Silicon Valley podcast.com. And with that,
Have a great week, everyone, and see you next week on the Silicon Valley Podcast. Thanks, sir.